Well, it's 10 o'clock, so we'll uh, <clears throat> go ahead and get started. Uh, I realize uh, everybody's digital this morning, so that's a little bit of a different, uh, a little bit of a different experience, but um, at least it is for me teaching to an empty room. <clears throat> But with God's grace, we'll, uh, we'll get through it. And, and hopefully there are those out there who are listening this morning that uh, you'll gain something from God's word and um, be blessed by it. So <clears throat> what we've been studying is out of the 11th chapter of Hebrews. And left, we left off with the end of verse 7. And we're looking at uh, the hall of faith. And as we look at how faith is being described in each of these people's lives, we see a practical uh, example from each of them. So we pick up there in verse 8 with Abraham, where it says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. <clears throat> By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. <coughs> Excuse me. So, as I said last week, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time going over Abraham's story, because uh, we've been going over that in Genesis. Uh, pastor taught on uh, the 11th chapter of Hebrews a couple of weeks ago. So I'm going to assume and take for granted that you know the story of Abraham sufficiently enough in your mind that you don't need a whole lot of reiteration of it. So keeping that story in mind, we draw some practical examples of faith from Abraham. And as we saw last week, as we looked at faith and what faith meant and how it was played out in the lives of those who mentioned, how Abel brought the very best that he, have, that he had because faith demanded it, how Enoch walked with God because faith demanded it, how Noah persevered in the face of certain scorn because faith demanded it. Here we have yet another example of what faith demanded from someone. And faith demanded that Abraham obey. So there's one of the first examples. Faith obeys. We see this quite clearly in the life of Christ. And everything that we're going to talk about in this chapter of where faith prompts an action, where faith creates something, you'll find this example paralleled in Christ. And in fact, I would, also, I would say not paralleled, typified, exemplified. He is the archetype. He is the pattern. And if you do not think that Christ is the pattern for obedience, uh, I, I challenge you, study more. <clears throat> he is the complete pattern for obedience. He knew what the, was waiting on him in his ministry. He knew what was there at the end, and he did not look forward to it. It says at one point in the scriptures that he despised the shame of it. And yet, he testified of himself, I come from, down from heaven not to, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. It's from the sixth chapter of John. <clears throat> Faith demands obedience to the Father. And sometimes that obedience means we don't quite clearly understand what it is that we're doing or why we're even doing it. 
But if we are to be people of faith, we are to walk by faith and not by sight. And sometimes that means not completely understanding what God has in store. I think there's a practical reason for that sometimes, at least in my own life, because if I knew exactly what God was doing, I'd probably try to tweak it. And in so tweaking, mess things up really, really bad. It's like kids who don't really understand computer equipment and they want to pop the cover off of something and they're like, ooh, let me touch this, let me touch that. And you're like, oh yeah, you just let out the magic smoke. And they're like, the magic smoke? I'm like, yes, when the smoke comes up, it doesn't work anymore. So whatever's in the smoke must be magic. I would be the exact same way with God in his place. Oh God, let me, let me touch this. Let me. And sometimes God is like, no, just obey. Understand later, obey first. Abraham obeyed. But there's another aspect here to Abraham's obedience. There's another aspect here to what God asked Abraham to do. And I find it very intriguing. Because if God simply asked Abraham to obey, I if, and if that was the complete and utter end of the working of faith in Abraham's life, frankly, I probably could have thought of better ways to typify it. If I'm really going to test you on obedience to see if you're going to obey, I could have done something like this. Abraham... Call together all of your friends, your family, your community. Get them all together. Put yourself in a hula skirt with no shirt on and dance the Macarena. Or some other dance that comes to your mind. That's, that's about as far as my dance knowledge goes. Make a complete fool of yourself in front of everyone that knows you and respects you, Abraham. Do that. If I'm just testing obedience, why not? <clears throat> and yet, that's not what God did. God said, Abraham, go to a far country. It's a huge sacrifice if we, in the way that we think of things. But isn't it interesting how what God asked of Abraham parallels what is being, going on in our own life? <clears throat> Abraham, look to a far country. Look to a place that you're going. Matt, look to heaven. Look to a place that you're going. I don't think that's coincidence. I think God's a lot more thoughtful than that. I think God's a lot more planned than that. I think what God is doing is doing a perspective shift. Abraham, you need to see things differently. And sometimes the only way that we see things differently is to break down all of the things that are around us and set our focus and our gaze on something else. And that's what he did with Abraham. And that's why faith is necessary to do that because faith latches onto something with such conviction with such assurance. To create a transformation within us. Faith demands that.
Because while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. See what it's talking about there from 2 Corinthians 4th chapter. See what it's talking about there. It is a switch. It is how we view things. It's a turning. It's a, it is fixing our mind on the spiritual and not the flesh, not the earthly. See, the flesh says, I want to see it, I want to taste it, I want to touch it, I want to feel it. Remember poor old Thomas. Unless I see the nail prints and put my hand in his side, I'll not believe. And what did Jesus tell Thomas? Thomas, you finally saw and you got to believe because you saw. And yes, you're blessed because of that. But I tell you, more blessed are they who believe and have n are never going to get this, Thomas. They're never going to touch me, handle me, hear me speak in the physical body. And they are more blessed. Now, to put that into perspective, if you want to get humbled for a minute, see, every one of those disciples that were standing there, they got to do exactly what Thomas did. They believed in the resurrection because they saw it. So let's not throw Thomas under the bus. They're all kind of in that bus. They're all kind of in that camp. Read how those men died. I think they believe Thomas made it as far as India. There's indications of that. And he didn't die of old age. They tore God's men apart. But Jesus said, I'm more blessed than they are because I believe and I haven't seen him. Folks, what does that mean of our faith and what it demands of us? The resolve that should be there in us, if they who saw him were able to be so convicted, so assured, had the evidence and the substance of their faith so laid before them that they were able to change the face of this world because of the faith that lived within them, the faith that demanded that they change the world for Christ. If we be more blessed than they, bring less to God. Doesn't seem quite right, does it? But faith has an eternal perspective. I, I love how it passes along from generation to generation when it is true and when it is just. Read here of how it says in this ninth verse, it includes Isaac and Jacob as part of that legacy. Part of the faith that lives within me demands that I want to see it for Haddon and Hudson. Not that they believe exactly like I believe because that's what their daddy believes and they're going to believe, believe it or else because that's what daddy said so... <clears throat> but because I know what lives inside of me, that there is nothing better in this world than that. There is nothing better than Christ. And because of that, and because I love my boys that much, I want what is best for them. And the absolute best thing in this life for them is the next life in Christ. 
Faith demands that of me. And love. But faith to be sure. And faith gives us that assurance that no matter how wicked this world may be, no matter how much trouble is in this world, heartache, worry, concern in this world, that there is a better place. God told Abraham, go to a better place. What did Christ tell us? I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. And he said, if I go and to prepare it, I will come again. Just on a side note, if you're ever in a struggle, I always highly encourage that 14th chapter of John. It's a blessing. It, it actually starts off with let your heart, let not your heart be troubled. So it should give you some sort of indicator. I also find it very interesting that what he told Abraham to do was get up from where you're at and go somewhere else. Faith demands a separation. To come out from among the world. Be ye separate, saith the Lord. And as we read over there in, in 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, this separation, we are to be a peculiar people, a strange people. Why are we to be peculiar and strange? Because we're to look like God. And the world does not look like God. And since broad is the path that leads to destruction, then most people are on the broad path. So ergo, anything that's not on the broad path is going to be strange. Christian worry when you feel too comfortable in this world. Be concerned because you're to be a stranger in a strange land, a pilgrim going to a place. See what God did there with Abraham? Abraham became a pilgrim going to a country. We are a pilgrim going to a country whose ruler is God. We're going to get into that. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. It, and it's very hard to do in, in this. It's very hard to do with Hebrews because Hebrews is such, it's a systematic building. And he's building it block by block by block. And it's, if you're very in tune to Scripture at all and you begin to see this argument as it's laid out, you can immediately jump to the end. You know where this is going. You know how he's building it. So all of these things that I'm saying, he's going to, the writer is going to plainly say here in just a few verses. But let's, let's, look, let's move on from it. Let's look at someone else that he gives an example of faith and how faith works in their life. By, through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because <clears throat> she judged him faithful who had promised. Now we, we were we had the privilege of of talking to some some godly folks last night and, and they're they're listening this morning and I apologize you're gonna you got a little bit of a preview last night and you're gonna get a little bit of a rerun this morning. Uh, but we were talking about Sarah and how honestly, you know, you look at it and you th most of us would honestly think first blush, well Sarah the Bible doesn't speak very well of Sarah. She laughs at God, she <laughs> He seems to doubt God. And yet here she is as mentioned as being in the hall of faith. What is the deal there? Why is that? And as I begin to study it and to wrestle with it and, and to, to plead with God and, and ask God, 
God, what are you trying to teach me there? What are you trying to say to me? And one of the things that, that God has begun to part back in my mind a little bit that became almost like saying, oh, yes, Lord, I do have a nose. Faith demands action. You may say you have faith. I have works. Show me your faith without your, your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. It's so easy and it's so tempting to read that as a way of bragging. I'll show you how faithful I am by the things that I do. That sometimes it seems like that's the way we read it, but that's not. I feel like the writer is being very analytical there, very cold in fact. I will prove to you the existence of faith by the works that is accompanied in that person's life. Faith demands action. Why did it become necessary to list Sarah here? Because at some point in her life, Sarah repented of the doubt of God. And in that repentance, because of faith, she changed. We often read of that as if, oh, well, you know, Sarah laughed at God. She didn't really believe God. But then she got pregnant and she just had a kid. And, you know, as if there was no volition on Sarah's part. As if she couldn't have backed out of that at any given point in time. She could have just said, I'm too old for this business. You got Ishmael, leave it alone. When she became pregnant, she could have said, I'm too old for this business. You have Ishmael, leave it alone. You're putting my life in danger. You want to talk about high-risk pregnancy? She is the very definition of, she's in her 90s. She's, like, going to be old enough to be the kid's grandmother or great-grandmother. She could have said, you are crazy, old man. You got your boy. Do not put me through this. And yet, the son of promise was born. Repentance is not saying I'm sorry. Repentance is not a feeling. Oh, what's working inside of you may produce feelings, but if that's as far as it goes, it's produced very little to anything. Faith does. That the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Not even so I feel, not even so I have a positive emotion, I have positive thoughts, I have positive feelings towards you. The Jesus that, if Jesus followed the worldly model, this, was, this would be how Jesus would, would have come. Jesus shows up, he's dressed really nice, like, you know, me, he's just really nice, good clothes, and he comes out to everybody and he's like, love you, mean it, peace out, I'm gone. Boop. I'm provoking positive feelings towards you. My thoughts are with you. I'll check you guys on the other side, going back up to heaven. Been sweet to be here. That's not what he did. And while 
Jesus had many interesting things to say, and by all means, please do not misunderstand what I'm saying. Study what he taught. Study what he said. But judge him by what he did. And yes, I'm using that word correctly. Judge him by what he did. Put it into context. Remember, King of kings, Lord of lords, crown prince of the heavenly host, was under absolutely no obligation to come here, and yet he did. Born in a barn amongst the awful and the refuse of livestock, Mocked by those who he's trying to help. Persecuted, run out of his own town. Willfully goes into Jerusalem. Willfully puts himself in front of a, a mock court. Beaten, whipped, scourged, crucified, died. Had the power to absolutely not endure any of it and yet endured it all. Why? Faith demanded an action. Faith does. Jesus, speaking of interesting things that he said, Jesus gave us a parable once of two sons. The father came and he said, go work in my fields. The one, said, one son said, oh yeah, dad, no problem. Cool, I got it, I got this. And nowhere to be found. The other son said, I will, I, no dad, no, I am. It's hot, I'm tired, I ain't doing it. Walks off and he gets to thinking about something. And he's like, no, no, I need to do it. And he goes and he does, he works in the fields. Jesus asked the question, which one of these sons did the will of their father? And they all answered correctly and said, the one that went and worked in the field. Faith demanded an action. One last illustration, and then I'll move on. One of my favorites that you've heard me say, and I will say again to bring it into our minds. As Solomon was in the height of his reign, the Lord spoke unto him a dire warning. And yet, one filled full of hope at the same time. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. This is very prescriptive. It's very formulaic in its sense. But if we will humble ourselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. So you could do all of that. You could humble yourself. You could pray. You could, I'm not sure how you could seek after his face and not turn from your wicked ways. But you could humble yourself, you could pray all night long, and then go right back out and do the same abominable works that we've always done. And the Lord is like, no, no, that's not going to work. That's not faith. It changes us.
And here's the great thing about it changing us. <clears throat> it changed Sarah. So what happened as a consequence of that? Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. See, faith changed Sarah. It changed Abraham. And the Bible clearly acknowledges that those two shouldn't have had a kid. That's what it means there when it says, <clears throat> let me read this correctly, and him as good as dead. What it's saying there is, yeah, Abraham, Sarah, way too old. That You guys have got one foot in the grave and one foot on a banana peel. And what it's truly meaning there is that this is God who did this, not them. God blesses a, a couple that's in their mid-twenties with a kid. How often do we really read that as God blessing? Or do we just read that as the natural consequences of nature? You take a couple as old as Abraham and Sarah, and who had been trying for a very, 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 very long time, the shape of it being a miracle takes on a whole lot more import. That's what it's reminding us there. So that <clears throat> they had a child, and from this child sprang forth a nation. And as awful as Israel could be at times, as reprobate and as adulterous as it could be at times. And it was. So don't misunderstand what I'm saying, about to say to take from that. But nonetheless, how many places in this world does not know the story of the Exodus? They're still making movies about it. One person, I think it might have been Dostoevsky, who made the quote that the Exodus story is the greatest literary story that was ever written, and it happened to be true. God wrote a bestseller. Who would have thunk it? Look at the blessings that came from the change in Abraham and Sarah. That's the beauty of what God does. And church, if you, if you don't hear much of what I say, listen to this. Listen to it especially clear. As faith demands action in your life, as faith transforms in your life, the blessings that God pours out will not be isolated to your life. It's contagious. I know, maybe a poor choice of words this morning. But it is. And it's not something we should be trying to protect ourselves from. We want to pass that along. And it blesses. And it talked about here of all the things that because of this faith creating this nation. And once again, look to Christ for that example. As he began to bless people and touch people, it, the fame of what he did spread abroad. And I know you could say, it like, well, but they really didn't believe. They all deserted him in the end. No, they didn't all desert him in the end. Not completely. Yes, the disciples were hiding like frightened children in a hole. But there was that little bit of, that little mustard seed of faith within them. And it grew. 
into that huge plant that is able to host birds on its branches. The whole world was changed because of Christianity. Even some of the most secular and godless men who've ever Deign to grace the halls of academia will acknowledge from a historical perspective how Christianity molded and influenced the world. Faith will do that. Don't forget that. Don't lose sight of that. Grab onto that. Because faith demands something else, and I've alluded to this earlier. It's important to remember that faith blesses others because that's something we have to hold on to because faith is going to demand a change of perspective within us. And sometimes that's hard, and if you do not keep all of the blessings that faith is in your mind, you will falter. That's what these folks had to do. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now, they, and oh God, I hope I, desire a better country that is in heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Faith demands a different focus. Where is your treasure? Where is your hope? Is it in our health, our bank accounts, our homes, our jobs, our families, or is it in Christ? If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. Colossians, third chapter. Set our affections on heavenly things, not earthly things. Faith demands a different focus. It's a different perspective. It's a different way to view things. It's a different point of view. And folks, that's a hard thing. And it's an even harder thing for me to teach it. And you say, well, why, does it, why is it a hard thing to teach? As someone who tries to mentor in engineering. If they don't understand something, I can come up with better illustrations, better examples. I can, you don't understand how the right hand rule works, I'll put a wrench in your hand and try to make you turn a bolt out. And if you keep going this way, you're going to understand that the bolt's just getting tighter. If you're going this way, you're going to understand the bolt's coming out. And yes, you look like you're a little bit of an idiot doing weird hand motions, but that's the right hand rule, not the left hand rule. So as someone who tries to mentor thing, people in engineering and such forth and so on, I can come up with better illustrations, I can come up with better examples, practicals, hands-on experiences, slideshows, monkeys and tutus dancing. I can do a lot of different things. But a perspective shift? I 
can't do that for you. I can't even really help you other than to pray. The Holy Spirit has to work in you for that. And you have to let him. And sometimes it's very hard for me that I have to let him do it within you. As, as much as I might want it, I have to let him. And it's one of those things that until it happens in you, you don't understand it. It's going to be confusing. It's going to be perplexing. And once it happens, you won't even understand why you didn't understand before. And yet faith demands that we shift our focus from an earthly perspective to a spiritual perspective. To give you an example of this, I love this example, 2 Kings 6 chapter. Days of Elisha. Servant gets up one morning and he goes out to the city and he starts losing his mind. We're surrounded. They're everywhere. They've got the city and camp. We're going to die. Elisha, game over, man. Game over. They're coming to kill us. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? I mean, he's in full-blown panic mode. And what does Elisha say? Lord, open his eyes. We've got them outnumbered. And the Bible says that the scales fell from his eyes and he looked out over the, and yes, while the army had the city surrounded, the heavenly host had the army surrounded. Angels, which had to have been terrifying. Because remember what one angel did in Egypt in one night. And yet there's legions of them. And this poor boy, once again, it's talking about how things shift. He looks at yes, yes, we're going to win. We're going to slaughter them. It's bloodthirsty time. Get them, kill them all. Let God sort them out. And what happens? The man of God walks out of the city and leads that entire army away. Because God struck them blind. It was a change in perspective. Elisha had a change in perspective. He did not view the way, the situation, the way that the servant did. And many lives were spared, and more importantly, the glory of God shone forth throughout the land. There is a, a change that comes over us. And it's different from the world. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. See, you see the difference there? The world will get, oh yeah, I'm sorry for what I've done, I'm sorry. But faith works repentance, a turning away of things. And it's hard for this to occur. I 
sometimes can only appreciate the frustration that Christ must have felt when he talked to his disciples. And poor old, I'm picking on Thomas a lot this morning, but poor old Thomas and Philip, they said, well, Lord, show us this way. Show, show me the way, Lord. Which, which way are you going? Show me. Give me the road map, Lord. Or, and, and that'll be enough. Show us the Father, Jesus, and it'll be enough. And Jesus, you could almost hear the incredulity in his voice. He's like, guys, how long have I been with you and you're asking me to show you the way? Were you not listening? I am the way. I and the Father are one and you're asking to see the Father. But they hadn't had that change of focus yet. And it took the crucifixion of our Lord for it to come into clarity for them. What will it take for us? But when it snapped, when they got it, oh, they got it. Beat me if you want to. Shut me in prison if you want to. Go ahead, shut me in prison. I like it. And you know why? There's sinners in prison. And sinners need Christ. Put me in there. They can't run away. You don't get it. You're not locking me in there with them. You're locking them in there with me. They can't go away. Nowhere to run to, no TV to turn on. I got them. It's a different focus. Amazing, isn't it? But if we're not careful, if we're so not careful, no matter what God does, no matter how God blesses, we will turn again like a dog to its vomit. Remember Lot's wife. God is destroying the city. Fire is hollowing souls. The angels of God are reaping a bitter harvest. And what does she do as they're walking? She can hear the judgment of God raining down. And she turns and she looks. I want to go back. I want to go back to my comforts, Lord. I want to go back. I want to go back to my sin, back to my vomit, back to my filth, oh Lord. And she lost her life. She was turned to salt. Remember Lot's wife. We can be that way if we're not careful. Faith demands a change of focus. And folks, if there's been a year that is illustrated how we need a change of focus, it has been this year. We're in a time that needs a change of focus. Look up. I don't care what virus rages. God is on the throne. I don't care what people are doing in the streets. God is on the throne. I don't care who sits on the Supreme Court or who sits in the White House. God is on the throne. Look to Christ. Don't become salt. And folks, that's a good place to end. I hope this is an encouragement. If it's a challenge to you, so be it. Be challenged. But grow. Grow. It is my prayer as a church that we change Blunt County and yet not stop there.
you may think, well, that's, that's a tall order. That may take us decades. That may take us centuries. Whom do you serve? If he created this whole thing in less than a week, think on it. We'll have a few minutes of intermission. <clears throat> I would take questions. I don't know if um, it's a little hard with Zoom, but if somebody has something burning, feel free. Um, or email me, or tie a note around a rock, chuck it through my house window. But folks, I appreciate those of you that have shown up, and we'll take a few minutes break, and we'll begin worship at 11. Thank you.